Hello and welcome everyone to American University's 2021 workshop series sponsored by the Measurement and Evaluation Program. At American University, we are committed to pursuing inclusive excellence. One of our practices shared from our indigenous and native communities is to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meetings and events. The goal is to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we all still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nakashtank, Anacostian, and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Welcome everyone joining us for our workshop on Indigenous Evaluation, How to Engage with Indigenous Tribes and Communities in Evaluation Research. Before our speakers get started, we'd like to hear a little bit about where you are joining us from. So if you'd like, please put in the text box and the chat box where you're from today and I will go ahead and read those out. Chevy Chase, Maryland, Washington, DC, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, native, Alaska native with ANA here in Washington, Chicago, Somerville, Columbia, Manhattan, Kansas. So we have people coming from all over the, uh, all over the US and a couple people joining us from other countries as well. That's great. We have two speakers today, Dr. Heather Gordon and Travis Roberts. They will be introducing themselves and Amy Zukowski is the Director of Program Evaluation and Planning at the Administration for Native Americans. She's going to be monitoring and, and the chat, asking, answering questions and perhaps forwarding them on to Heather and Travis. So go ahead and please use the chat box if you wanna ask a question. Let me welcome our speakers and thank everyone for being here today. Very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go. Um, and Amy, if you just wanna hold those until the end, we'll just do all questions at the end. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can click here. Okay, so we're gonna uh, just start out with a little disclaimer um, because we're government employees. We will also do a land acknowledgement. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about where we work. And then um, we're gonna get into, you know, why we do this work in this way, uh, working with indigenous people and how we do it as well. So just as a disclaimer, uh, Travis and Amy and I were all employed by the Administration for Native Americans, which is part of the Administration for Children and Families in HHS. Um, these views are based on Travis and my research in our graduate work. So it is not necessarily uh, ANA perspectives um, or from work we've done at ANA. Um, we just also want to do a, a land acknowledgement um, and we actually invite you to take a minute because we are all over, uh, which is really interesting. Um, I, I dropped in a a link, but I also dropped in a phone number. If you're in the US, you can actually text to that phone number and you can get a response of whose lands you were on. I don't know if you've seen that before. Um, and the, the, the link in the internet link will take you to a map um, and show overlapping uh, historic um, land um, that was historic American uh, Native American land. Uh, so uh, our office is located in DC. So we, we recognize that we sit on the traditional land of the Pescatawi and Nokotank and Anacostan people. 
Uh, we honor their traditions, their elders, and their living culture, and give our respect to them as they have stewarded this land for generations. We also recognize the colonialization, genocide, and the resulting historical trauma that did and um, continue to, in some cases, experience in Indigenous communities uh, worldwide. So we just uh, will pause briefly and think about the Indigenous resilience uh, through both past and present colonialism and the great difficulty our relatives have faced. All right, a little bit about ANA. Um, it was established in 1974 through the Native Americans Program Act. And we provide grant funding to uh, American Indian Alaska Native federally and state recognized tribes, Native nonprofits in all 50 states, including um, Native populations and nonprofits in uh, Native in Hawaii, as well as the Pacific Basin. So American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So ANA's goal is to provide self-sufficiency and cultural preservation uh, to Native Americans by funding social and economic development projects, um, as well as language revitalization projects, um, environmental monitoring projects, and then we have technical uh, and training providers that can also assist our grantees in their work. Um, so we are from the Division of Program Evaluation and Planning. So just to introduce myself, uh, Pagla Gifsi, Atiga Heather Soyak Jean Gordon, Inupiak Signiga Soyak, Akaga Sue Elizabeth Borden, Apaga William Lewis Strutz. So uh, my name is Heather Soyak Jean Gordon. My Inupiak name is Soyak. Um, and my mother is Sue Elizabeth Gordon, and my father is William Lewis Strutz. I was born and raised in Homer, Alaska on a reindeer ranch, actually. I'm a Nupiak and an enrolled member of the Nome Eskimo community. Um, I work at ANA in the program evaluation and planning, and my PhD is in Indigenous Studies through the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I have done extensive work um, around incorporating Indigenous knowledge, uh, self-determination, culture, sustainability, and well-being and how to uh, build mutually beneficial research partnerships. I just want to help you understand where I'm coming from by explaining that the work I do is based around being a good relative to the Indigenous community. Um, so I wanna just talk briefly about, uh, here you can see in Alaska off to the left there, uh, my family is from that Northern part, the light blue. Um, my great-great-grandmother, Ella Kaguna Becker, was originally from Utkiagvik, which used to be called Barrow, which is at the top of Alaska. And then um, she moved down to Nome, which is, if you look at Alaska, is kind of having a nose there. It's on the tip of the Seward Peninsula. And that's where my grandmother, uh, Margaret Cecilia Becker, was born, and her daughter, um, I mean, my great-grandmother, and then her daughter, my grandmother, Mary uh, Jean Kaguna Yeni. So my family experienced uh, the Great Death, which was the influenza epidemic in Alaska, which many communities lost 70 to 90% of their community and um, many adults, sometimes up to 100% of adults. So all those children were then put in um, non-native homes, often for orphanages. So you can see a cultural disconnect there. Uh, we have continual cultural disconnect issues around uh, boarding school, um, assimilation only education, English only education, and uh, Jim Crow racism, if you didn't know, was not only a thing of the South, but was also practiced in Alaska. Uh, no natives in this half of the movie theater, you can't use that water fountain, separate schools for natives and non-native students, um, and all of that. So we really honor, um, I really honor my relatives and their uh, resilience and survival. And now I will let Travis introduce himself. Tanshi Nia Travis, Nawik in Washington, Ochina Calgary, Emi Fami, Ochina Payak Treaty at Sikri at Satu Ojibwe. So that is a greeting of Machif. My name is Travis. I live here in Washington, but I'm originally from Calgary, Alberta. And my family is from the Treaty One region in Canada, which is in sort of the Winnipeg area, right in the heart of the Metis homeland. I'm also a citizen there of the Manitoba Metis Nation. And I'll explain a little bit about what that is for those of you who don't know. I work as a program analyst and impact evaluator alongside Heather in ANA's Division of Program Evaluation and Planning. And I came there after finishing my master's in public health, where I focus on mental health research and humanitarian health at Johns Hopkins University. 
um, and a master's in social work from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. So I've done a lot of work in violence prevention. I continue to work on the issue of missing and murdered indigenous people at ANA um, and have taken typically a sort of a systems dynamic look at complex crises like community violence against children, for instance, uh, and, and seek to try to incorporate spirituality and mental health, other local and cultural uh, risk and prevention factors, and as well as a focus on indigenous self-determination. Um, to introduce my family a little bit, uh, one of my kind of main guideposts has been my grandfather, Dr. Raoul McKay. Um, so he was a Métis historian and educator who started uh, one of Canada's first Native Studies programs at the University of Manitoba um, and also received an Aboriginal Achievement Award for Education for his work, uh, not only starting those kind of programs and teaching throughout his life, but also um, the documentaries that he produced uh, up until he passed um, that really focused on Canada's Indigenous people, including the Métis. So down there on the map in the uh, bottom right corner, you can see uh, the Métis flag. It's that infinity sign on a blue background. Um, and that's covering the traditional Métis homeland. So we are a mixed race people. Um, in previous generations, you know, my grandpa would tell stories about being called half breed and things like that, but where our communities formed when French and Scottish uh, fur traders came in through the Red River Valley, um, met and married local Cree Ojibwe Sutu women um, and produced really a unique culture there with our own uh, language histories, traditions. Um, so we are, along with the First Nations and Inuit, one of the three divisions of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And there are also Métis communities here in the States, uh, particularly in kind of the Pembina, North Dakota area. Fantastic. Thank you, Travis. Yep. Uh, so we're going to be talking about how do we do research with Indigenous people in a good way. Um, I don't know how much exposure you have in Indigenous communities, but you'll often heard this term in a good way be thrown around at the start of a meeting or at the start of a gathering. So what does that mean? It's talking about honoring our tradition and spirit, honoring our elders and our history. Um, so Travis and I, in seeking to open this presentation in a good way, uh, started by providing a land acknowledgement, introducing ourselves in our Indigenous language, and then trying to help orient you to our families and where we're from, uh, calling on our ancestors and our lineages and tribal affiliations as well. So starting this presentation, I'm just gonna start, oops, talking a little bit about um, colonization and historical trauma starting uh, with really first contact. Um, so colonization uh, was very traumatic as it brought with it what I'm, I'm sure you've heard of genocide and wars, um, later boarding schools, uh, specific legislation that outlawed Native American religions, that outlawed certain dances um, in, in different Native American communities. Um, and actually, those were actually... Uh, by federal law, like not allowed. And it, was, it wasn't until, you know, into the, the last, you know, 50, 60 years that we have some of those things being reversed um, in the United States. So I just wanna talk about how that legacy of colonization has really um, impacted the indigenous people and left uh, a historical trauma, which is actually passed down intergenerationally um, within indigenous communities. And so some of the things you will see in, in regards to historical trauma today um, can be uh, physical and mental um, different health issues that might be uh, more pronounced in indigenous communities. Uh, you could see um, also um, there's been links to you know, high suicide rates, um, you know, and things being tied to that colonization that resulted in like a loss of culture and a loss of language. Um, in my family, specifically, my great uh, grandma, Margaret, attended Holy Cross boarding school and they were not allowed to speak their language. So she actually never taught it to all of her children. Um, so it ended in my family at that age. And she was perfectly fluent up until when she died. Uh, she just didn't want them to go through what she had gone through. So uh, we mentioned here that there's this cycle of trauma, you know, being passed down generation to generation um, with that oral history and uh, with the responses to trauma, uh, whether that be grief or stress or, you know, be manifesting in actual physical ailments as well. And then we continue on from historical trauma and find that um, it's being continued to traumatize Native communities through research abuses that have happened. Um, 
so often maybe there's good intentions. Uh, more recently, I would say at least good intentions. A historical anthropology and archaeology perspective, you know, came in and took from the communities, um, took from burial mounds, uh, took from graves. Things are still in museums. Um, and universities throughout the world uh, that Native people are working on repatriating um, to their own communities and to their relatives' grave sites. I just want to talk briefly about the barrel alcohol study as it gives a really great example of something that can go really wrong. So it was done in the 1970s, and when the results came out, it was done in the Utqiagvik area, now the very north of Alaska, and there was uh, starting to be an influx of outsiders as oil was discovered in the Arctic. And so they did this study on alcohol use in the indigenous people in that area. And when they got the results of the study, instead of meeting with the community members and talking about that and situating those results within the historical trauma and colonization that's happened in the community, instead they actually went to press first. Um, and then we see showing up on newspaper, alcohol plagues, Eskimos, um, the Society of Eskimos, uh, they don't think that it will survive the next 30 years. All these really like broad uh, stereotyping statements being applied to the whole population um, when it was, you know, some people um, were using alcohol excessively. Another example of research abuse was the Havasupai Indian tribe in Arizona. They agreed to do a type 2 diabetes study. And then their blood draw, their drawn blood was used to do um, genetic uh, tests as well, and they started looking into the origins, where the people were from, all things that they had not agreed upon, um, and their blood was being sent out to other labs to test and everything. So, you know, really just looking at, uh, you know, how can you do research in communities and not cause a more trauma? Health research is often a detriment-based research, which means it's framed in the way of, okay, this community has this percentage that smokes, but this community has this percentage that smokes cigarettes, you know, or something. And so it's, it's starting from that detriment perspective of a community, which can really lead, if you look at the Barrow Alcohol Study, to marginalization and stereotyping. So... We're up to 2020 now. Why are we still discussing this? Because the problems are still happening. In a letter written to the National Science Foundation in 2020, multiple Alaska Native groups came together to address co-production in the Arctic around research, talking specifically about the navigating the new Arctic NSF funding stream. Um, the community specifically said, you know, we don't want these researchers coming in here with their full proposal written and just asking for our letter of support. You know, that is not meaningful engagement. That is not co-production. Um, they want the projects to be grounded in their interests because some researchers are re researching things the community already knows. Um, you know, and if they're going to be doing research in that area, how can they build capacity, employ community members? You know, a traditional anthropological model was to come in and just interview elders and just take all that data and go publish a book. Um, now, uh, we, we say that, you know, community members should be paid for what they're providing. Some things that they provide might not even be appropriate to be given out and shared out to the wider, wider world as well. So really emphasizing the tribal sovereignty and self-determination of Indigenous people and respecting uh, their research priorities and perspective. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how do we do co-production? We can start looking at that through participatory research models. Um, so I said before, non-Indigenous people used to be considered the experts on Indigenous people. They were the ones writing down our languages and our history, while our cultures were often very oral. Um, and we do pass on that history. We just do it through stories um, and through uh, intergenerational connection. So there are ways to utilize participatory methodologies um, to work with Indigenous people, even if your participatory uh, methodology is grounded in a traditional Western-based approach, such as participatory action research or community-based participatory research, there are ways to adapt these methodologies to an Indigenous um, perspective. So they can be, even if they aren't a true Indigenous methodology, they can be in alliance with Indigenous methodologies and have those principles um, and the grounding in the culture you're working with. So we want to talk about the importance of respecting self-determination and sovereignty. 
we want to talk about the importance of respecting the community in the amount of contribution and partnership they would like. Some communities you will find might want the full co-production model, the, the uh, research questions coming from the community, the community members being involved in data analysis, being co-authors. Some communities you're going to find don't want that much involvement. Um, they're, they're already uh, too busy with other things. And, you know, if uh, you are doing the write-up, they can, you know, work with you through drafts and reading it. But, you know, they might not actually want to be authors uh, on the work with you. So it's just something something to consider, you know, can we respect people in the amount that they would like to be involved? So this picture here was from a project that used participatory action research and was adapting it to the indigenous medicine wheel model, which is a circle with these colors of yellow, red, black, and uh, white that shows spirituality, uh, physical health, mental health, and emotional health. But for here, they've tried to adapt that to a, a project model. So it's a unique perspective. Uh, this, um, from this article here, they show different levels of community presentation. So, um, you know, think of where you are on that scale. Are you um, coming with your pre-written proposal and just trying to get uh, the community to sign off that you're allowed to do work in their community? Or are you on the other end in the indigenous model where the work is centered in indigenous values and systems uh, grounded in indigenous knowledge and community members actually are having authority over the research process. Um, next, I wanna talk about again, how to do this research. So you're, you're first uh, utilizing our participatory model and then you're utilizing an asset-based approach. You had heard me talk a little bit about the issues with the deficit-based approach, especially around health research. So the asset-based approach is a really good way um, to approach research that allows uh, the researcher to focus on the self-determination and sovereignty the community has looking at the indigenous knowledge, culture, and identity as protective factors in the community. So uh, reasons for utilizing this asset-based approach is that it knows that there was historical trauma and research abuses in the community in the past. And now we're looking, you know, how can we have hope for the future? How can we avoid further stereotyping, marginalizing, and traumatizing these communities? Um, having this forward thinking approach um, is often uh, very in line with indigenous thought processes. You'll often hear about seventh generation thinking um, out of um, the Iroquois area where people are talking about thinking of sustainability or health all the way seven generations into the future. Um, so this doing this asset-based approach allows us to not focus on the negative things, poverty and suicide rate. So just as a simple example, if you're going to explore alcohol use um, from an asset-based approach, you would most likely talk to the people not using the alcohol. What are the protective factors in their community around, um, you know, what is keeping this, this group of people away from those behaviors? Um, I was just talking to Travis yesterday about missing and murdered Indigenous people and exploring that from an asset-based approach, looking at those communities that don't have missing and murdered Indigenous people or very low numbers. What are they doing differently? Uh, are they, do they have um, greater percentage of uh, indigenous language speakers, you know, do they have uh, sweats and cultural activities? Like what are the differences you can find to build on those strength um, approach so that other communities can take that on as well? Um, another thing to think about when you're working through that um, uh, participation process, you know, where you are on the scale is thinking about free prior and informed consent. Uh, this was something that was laid out in the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous People. Um, and it explains that um, consent can be given or withheld. Uh, so if, if the, you come with your idea and no one wants to work with you, you know, you might not get to work with that community because they don't want to do it. Um, they should be able to consent or refuse uh, free from intimidation um, or pressure. They should also be able to give that consent prior to the start of the project. 
um, giving enough time to allow the community to make a decision. You know, it might require community meetings or tribal council meetings. You know, things can't just be decided immediately as many indigenous cultures actually practice um, unanimous consent to make decisions. Uh, so they, they wanna all be in agreement with moving forward with something. Um, you wanna make sure the community is informed. Are you actually, you know, um, walking through how the whole project or evaluation will be. And then thinking again that they can give or withhold consent, but they can also give or withhold consent at any point in the project and choose partway through to no longer be participating if they do not feel it's serving their community. Um, so these free prior and informed consent are a way to think about uh, negotiating um, how a project can be run in a way with the community where they are getting benefit and deciding that it's a good thing for them. There are some issues with the word consent. Um, specifically, you will also often find uh, when legalese looks back at past treaties signed with Indigenous people that they, they consider those were consensual treaties to have their land all taken. Um, however, we think, hmm, was that free or was there intimidation through um, threat of war and things like that? So, you know, um, an issue with consent in Indigenous communities can be having that knowledge of the tie to treaty language. Another issue working with Indigenous communities is there is community and individual consent. So how are you able to get community consent? Is there um, a tribal council? Are you being asked to go through a tribal IRB? Do you have a community advisory board that is working with you on the project? So who is able to consent on behalf of the community? And then with each individual person you work with, are they of age to consent? And um, around, you know, if you're doing IRB protocols, which I'm pretty sure you would be if you're working with human subjects. And then I, I heard a fantastic talk given by an Athabascan elder, Justin Wilson, talking about that you have to ask permission to even begin to acquire consent. So are you even someone who has a right to ask permission from that community alone? And this is where you start to really get, you know, deep into those histories of colonization and where you are in that. So I really wanna talk about knowing yourself as a researcher and an evaluator. Um, having the idea that uh, objectivity is possible in research is very often a myth. You, your positionality is all over the place in everything you do, everything you write, everything you think. Uh, positionality is the social and political context that creates your identity. Looking at your race, your class, your gender, your age, your sexuality. Um, also how you define yourself and your identity. What are you biased towards? Um, and and what, what color sunglasses are you wearing that is coloring your outlook of the world to your specific perspective? Not saying that's bad, just saying that we recognize that. And by recognizing that we begin to be reflexive, examining our own beliefs and judgment throughout the research process seeing where some of our um, history and family and all these things come in to um, when we have immediate results to something we hear, we have an immediate feeling come on us, you know, that's really in the way we were raised and in the, the way we see ourselves. Uh, finally, having that relationality aspect, how do you now relate to the people you're working with? And can you understand that in indigenous communities, People do not only relate to the other people in the communities, but they see relationality with all things. There's relationality among uh, the land, the animals, the air, the sky, all of these things um, indigenous people have uh, reflexivity and relationality around that helps ground them in who they are, their specific sp positionality. I'm gonna talk briefly now about an indigenous relational framework. Um, so, uh, I previously showed you that picture of a participatory action research model that they adapted to work with indigenous communities, even though participatory action research is a me method grounded in Western uh, history and Western uh, methodology practice. So this model actually came out of my master's research where I uh, interviewed North American um, Arctic researchers and I interviewed Inuit Greenlanders and we discussed how can you have a mutually beneficial research relationship? 
So what really ended up coming out of that was this eight step model with the absolute center core and foundation being establishing trust between the researchers and the community. The first, um, so I, this model specifically can be used um, in my experience with not just indigenous communities, but if you're working in a community of color or in an underrepresented community, um, there's often specific methodologies and reflexivity that people will employ working in such communities like say um, in a nursing home with specific older population, or if you're working in a community of people who identify as um, LGBTQ, uh, to um, to spirit or uh, other gender identities. You're often working with a group that is not uh, considered the majority of the population. So there's extra considerations to understand their culture and to understand their perspectives, to be able to work with them in a respectful and appropriate way. So this model starts with uh, you doing a little background research and looking up the history of the community. What other research has been done in that community um, so that you are not recreating trauma that has already happened in the community? Uh, for me, with my uh, dissertation research, um, I ended up partnering with the Nanelchik Village Tribe, and I actually had one of their employees in my um, dissertation in one of my classes, one of my PhD classes. And so I was really started out learning uh, the community history from him, um, pointing me in different areas to look, talking about past research in the area. Um, and then, then he ended up serving as a local contact for me. Having a local contact is a fantastic way to work in a, a community that might be a little wary of outsiders because someone can vouch for you and introduce you. Um, this specifically, if you, if you don't have prior relationships to a community, usually in doing that community history project, you can see, oh, you know, this researcher has worked with them before. Maybe I can contact them. Or, you know, they have a relationship with this health center. Maybe I can reach out there. There's usually a way you can reach out to someone to help you enter the community appropriately. A communication is a key thing, you know, not only in the co-production of um, your uh, evaluation or research model, um, but also um, just the importance of having that transparent communication from the start all the way through. So you being transparent about who you are, your positionality and where you're from, and um, being transparent about your project ob objectives, your interest, communicating with the community um, what you plan to do and whether they like that plan or not. Are you listening and taking that feedback? A big thing I'll talk a little more at the end is about giving back on your project. Communicating really lets you know what the community would like you to give back, um, which most times is not just a copy of your dissertation or thesis emailed to them. Um, you'll find that respect is uh, very important, especially working with indigenous communities and um, self-determination and sovereignty. Also, it's important in looking at what is the appropriate channels to start contacting the community. Is there a council? Is there a community of advisory board? You know, to make sure that you are demonstrating that you're putting in the time to uh, treat people fairly. And also um, not just organize everything um, you know, by email and phone call, but actually going there and having some face-to-face -face contact. Like I started uh, coordinating with uh, the Ninonelchik Village Tribe for my dissertation at the end of 2016. At the start of 2017, they had sent me a letter that they would be willing to partner with me. We didn't have a project or questions yet. We were just establishing that we would at least talk and, and start partnering. And then I visited the community in July of 2017. So we're already seven months into my knowing the community history, developing contacts. And in July, I actually went there and we hammered out what, what the research questions were gonna be, what the methods were gonna be and how we were gonna do the project. I have good manners on here because it's often the how of communication. Um, people say, oh, communicating, you know, it's common sense, we all do it, but is it really, you know, it's done differently in different cultures and having the manners appropriate to that culture so that you're not being offensive through something that might be totally acceptable in your culture or understanding if you're in a culture that um, does not like, so Western culture very much is about direct eye contact. 
Um, and you know, you may be in a culture where people younger than you will never give you direct on eye contact because that's actually them showing you a form of respect. It's not them ignoring you. So, you know, there can be um, in this learning process about the culture, there, there can be things you learn that will help you interact with people. I also put institutional ethics on here. You know, not only are you going through the appropriate community level things, but you're also going through um, the um, institutional review board, uh, whether you have to do that just at your university. Sometimes in some indigenous communities, you'll be required to do it at your university, at the local health center, and possibly even at a tribal IRB or a community advisory board. There can often be multiple layers of permission that you're asking before you can get consent. Um, the importance of exchanging knowledge is so, so key because, um, you know, if you're having a mutually beneficial research relationship, then you both want to be getting something out of it. Uh, the community wants to be building capacity. They want, you know, to, to have their youth be exposed to science. They want to, um, you know, learn something from you. Um, and this process of exchanging knowledge and giving back is really something that has to be negotiated with the community. My work in Greenland, as much as I was talking about building relationships and things like that, the things that people wanted from me were very different. Um, they wanted me to attend their community choir and with my uh, recording device that I had brought for the interview, record their choir and then burn it on a CD when I got home and send it back to them so they could have recordings of themselves. So there might be something that seems unrelated, but you might have something that they don't have. Um, even physical and natural scientists going out doing research on the land, um, can give back to the community. They can bring students out with them and teach them about their instruments. And they can also come into the classroom and you know, talk about the work they're doing. And so that is just uh, my background, giving you a little bit about why we do work the way we do and a little bit about one indigenous relational theoretical framework, that last model that can be used to adapt Western methodologies to the community you're working with. And now Travis will give another specific example. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, I'm going to be looking specifically at uh, the world of mental health, specifically adapting uh, interventions and evaluation to an indigenous setting. Um, so we all know that evaluation is a vital part of every intervention and research project. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about one specific application and that, that is in that mental health space. Uh, it's a really interesting case to look at when we're considering culture. What are we talking about when we talk about depression, anxiety, or obsessive compulsive disorder? We aren't talking about rigid objective biological diseases. We're talking about clusters of symptoms that often have neurochemical causes, but they also have etiologies and presentations that can vary tremendously by culture, right? You don't uh, have a, a gene or a pathogen that causes depression. You have a number of symptoms like low energy, uh, sadness that persists for multiple days, suicidal ideation that we have clustered together and said, when you present a certain number of these symptoms to a certain severity, we're gonna call that depression. Um, and those specific disorders can present uh, differently in different cultures. You may have certain symptoms being more or less prevalent. With that said, there's a standardized manual for diagnosing men mental health disorders called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM. And we need to be mindful that that manual uh, is, was developed, researched, and tested in a specific cultural context. So this all applies to evaluation in a few ways. If you're trying to detect changes in mental health or well-being, looking for the same symptoms, clusters of symptoms, or even disorders that you look for in the quote-unquote general population can lead you astray. If I'm looking to see if my intervention has improved rates of depression in the community, but depression manifests differently in a specific community than it does in the populations that were tested in the DSM, and your evaluation fails to take that into account, you may falsely detect a change or even fail to detect actual change. So we're risking both false positives and false negatives. Let's take it a step further. If you wanna detect whether you've improved the overall mental health of the community, you need to be looking for changes in the right disorders. If you're trying to judge whether physical health has improved in a typical American suburb, and you only test for malnourishment and not say diabetes or heart disease, you're not gonna generate useful information, right? Mental health is even trickier for diseases that are undescribed or underdescribed in the general literature, including the DSM. 
So let's take a look at an example of a, uh, of a culturally bound syndrome here. Uh, the Navajo or Diné people of the Southwest describe a syndrome called Icha, which is marked by nervousness, convulsions, and violence inflicted against the self and others. That syndrome was listed in the fourth edition of the DSM, but not really described, and it's not in the fifth edition. And that particular cluster of syndromes I've just listed does not directly correspond to any other disorder the DSM describes. That's a fairly drastic example, but it's a helpful guidepost. If this very visible, unique disorder exists, what more suitable examples of culture-bound syndromes might exist in Navajo Nation? How can we be sure we're accurately measuring the community's mental well-being if the diagnostic tools we use aren't capturing all the disorders present? Of course, getting the right diagnosis is just one part of adapting an evaluation and uh, adapting an intervention and evaluating it. And of course, as evaluators, we need to be involved in every stage of the evaluation and, and uh, adaptation, particularly during that adaptation phase where you're engaging in that collaborative iterative process that involves communicating and collaborating with the community, making adjustments to the intervention, measuring the impacts, going back, making new changes, measuring those impacts on and on. Um, so yeah, so that, that covers, I think, a few of those considerations uh, to bear in mind. Of course, looking at that asset-based framework, we're not just looking for what unique disorders exist. We're also looking at what unique strengths or resources or protective factors the communities have. And we're going to get into that a little bit in a specific example on the next page. Um, McGill University up in Canada has a few principles of cultural adaptation uh, that are listed there. Um, those are helpful to, to review and think through as we're considering adaptation. Um, so just keep in mind, a lot of the causes for these syndromes um, can also be culturally bound. Uh, we can think of historical trauma, for instance, uh, adverse childhood experiences may be more or less common in specific settings. Some communities may have entirely different adverse childhood experiences than are discussed in the general literature. Um, all of that is, is important to keep in mind. Um, and one thing to, to just bear in mind is we're doing all this work from a position of strength, right? We're not adapting evidence-based practices to make them less effective versions of the real thing. That's not what happens when we do that adaptation of interventions. Adaptation is a way that we're actually improving interventions both by testing and refining them in specific settings and by utilizing the unique strengths of a community to achieve better results. So it's, it's not about watering something down to be politically correct. It's actually about making it more scientifically rigorous, more helpful to the communities that we're trying to serve. Um, okay, you can go ahead to the next slide. So I wanna talk about um, some work that was done out of Johns Hopkins um, with a community called White Mountain Apache. So there's been a long history of collaboration between Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health and White Mountain. Um, I worked in my master's practicum on a project uh, with Apache where we were looking at uh, adverse childhood experiences and trying to see if there were maybe unique ones in that community or, or how the general scale of, of ACEs mapped uh, in, in Apache. Um, those results haven't been published yet, or I'd be talking about those, but I do want to talk about another example here where um, basically we had this uh, evidence-based practice called New Hope. Um, and what this was, was an emergency department intervention for youth who made suicide attempts. And we were looking at this project in Apache because they had a really high rate of suicide that manifested after, particularly after the 1980s, looking at youth. Really before the 1950s, there weren't really solid records of suicide. It didn't seem to be a community problem. And all of a sudden, after this era of colonialization, a lot of the problems that Heather talked about that the Inuit faced are, are also echoed down in Apache we start seeing this crop up. Um, so the community wanted to address it and they picked this particular adaptation because there was a large evidence base behind it. It was a pretty brief adaptation. It was gonna be easy to implement. It was youth focused and it, it filled a gap that they didn't really have in the community existing. So there were trainings, there was a video to show families and there was on-call therapy. So what kind of adaptations did they make? Um, so first they renamed the program, they called it New Hope. And uh, they changed it instead of focusing on emergency rooms, they were focusing on the home and family because these were really important structures in this community. And these uh, home and family caretakers had some solid resources to work with youth and make sure that they were protected against suicide. They took a look at the video, um, they remade it using native aesthetics, characters and culture. So, you know, we weren't just showing this Apache community a video um, with all white people in it. We were 
there was a real effort made to remake that from the ground up so it it reflected what was going on in the community so the kids who were watching it would see themselves in it um and then they also worked to incorporate apache elders and language again this was another one of those things as, as we go in and, and test and see what resources are there and make changes to the adaptation we realize okay these elders are a huge source of community support they have so much knowledge about the problems that these kids are facing they have so much knowledge about uh, their traditions and culture that can serve as a protective factor for the kids let's incorporate them and the language as well right this wasn't just uh, you know the language isn't necessarily commonly spoken on the reservation but what's helpful about it is that it serves as a really powerful tie to the culture and community right if you're speaking uh, the language that your grandparents and great-grandparents and ancestors in memorial spoke all of a sudden you're not speaking the language of the you're not just limited to the language of the colonizer you're not just limited to this language that was introduced into your community of violence you're connected to a much larger and, and longer heritage. So Heather and I are looking at doing some more work at, as, at language as a protective factor, because this is such a major area of focus for the administration for Native Americans. But I, I'm pretty confident what we're going to find is that those um, interventions that include language are, are really powerful and really helpful. And finally, they, they just also wanted to make sure that this adaptation was usable by the local health system, which is very kind of diffuse, you know, covers a large area. Um, so just having it focused in, in one particular emergency room might not be very helpful. And what does the evaluation methodology look like here? Well, I mean, a, a few principles as you're going through a process like this, where you adapt an existing intervention into another setting and, and you're doing some of that evaluation along the way, you want to compare that adaptive methodology to the original and head-to-head -head trials wherever possible. But keep in mind that you're going to have certain constraints when you're especially as you sort of stack these adaptations on top of each other. Um, so one helpful tool you can use is just trying to parse out those individual components, right? So just making really small changes here. Okay, let's just compare um, the same intervention, but we've swapped the video out. What are the results out of that? Or are we seeing any kind of increased mark change in the group that's seeing the the Apache-oriented video? And that's one of, again, that that area of kind of measuring growth, this coincides with that asset-based approach we talked about, where we want that base hypothesis, including improvement for all groups, right? We're assuming that both the group who's taking the traditional training and the group that's getting the adaptation are gonna receive some benefit from it. We don't wanna introduce an adaptation we think is harmful, right? But what we're really measuring for here is who's benefiting more. Um, and, you know, I think the assumption and, and what we've seen proven on a lot of cases is that this adaptation is going to improve the results um, more dramatically than the original intervention would. You want to utilize community partners to identify trial participants. Again, this is not a thing where you go to the community, um, you kind of get direction, and then you go and implement. You should be involving the community in every stage, including recruiting participants for your trials, including you know, making these considerations and the adaptations, including involving them in the measurement, right? This is something that we definitely wanted community members to do when we're doing qualitative evaluations, having them actually conduct the, the key informant interviews, et cetera. Um, finally, you also wanna consider secondary outcomes of the trial ahead of time, integrating results into those iterations of the design, right? The primary objective here is to reduce suicidality, but what are some other potential benefits um, that, that you can produce from this? think about those scales you want to use and what you want to detect for. So when we did that ACES trial, right, we weren't just looking for, um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to incorporate was historical trauma. So we included a scale for historical trauma on the assumption that adaptations that were based on this new revised ACES scale were also going to improve measures for historical trauma, not just the other primary measures that, that uh, people usually look for when they're doing ACES studies. Um, and of course, interviewing those community members to develop new indicators um, is a really helpful step. And so you can actually develop new scales out of that process of working with the community. So a question you might ask in this case is, what are all the changes a youth might experience as a result of participating in New Hope? And you can go through various uh, qualitative methodologies to, to parse out a specific list um, from those kind of interviews and, and then have a new set of indicators that you can potentially develop into a new scale. 
Um, of course, and, and then one other baseline thing, especially when we're dealing with mental health, you really want to work, make sure that you're connecting your participants with trusted local partners if they're concerned. So for instance, in this case, uh, the researchers really work to make sure um, that all their participants could be connected with tribal health providers if they detected any kind of suicidal ideation as they were, as they were going through their study. Um, so yeah, those are some, some basic guideposts. Um, I'd want to point you guys to Dr. Mary Quick, that's C-W-I-K at Johns Hopkins, who conducted the study. Um, look at her research. Uh, she's really phenomenal, this kind of thing, and has been doing the work for a long time. Um, just want to give credit to her and the team at White Mountain um, with Johns Hopkins. So I will close there. Um, yes, thank you very much for dropping that into the chat. All right, thank you so much, Travis. Um, we, I know this is being video recorded, so I'm just gonna go through each citation slide and just give it some time. So if you wanna go back, you can always pause and uh, go in there and see some of the things we cited. Uh, we wanted to provide you some different resources um, to be able to draw on later. So, you know, you saw some of our slides are cited inside the slides as well. Um, there's this, um, Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC, um, organized through the National Science Foundation, which has actually a fantastic page on lots of different resources on how to work with Indigenous people as well. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us today. And um, we just wanted to mention the funders for the different projects Travis and I were on. Uh, there was funding through the National Science Foundation and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for my work. And there was funding through the National Institutes of Mental Health that in the Apache work that Travis was talking about at John Hopkins. Um, if you have any questions, I also stuck our emails down here if you think of something later. Um, but thank you so much for attending today. Thank you very much for for teaching us all of this really important information and helping us to, to navigate some of the questions that the students and alums are asking as evaluators. I think that some students have been <clears throat> sending through questions to Amy. Amy, do you wanna go ahead and? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Those? Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to um, Heather and Travis um, for a great presentation. Um, the first question that we had was, um, do you see, getting back to the asset-based um, approach, do you see projects from the government, NGOs, philanthropies um, taking an asset-based approach? It depends. <laughs> I know at, at ANA, we, we really have tried to shape our um, funding opportunity announcements in a way that emphasizes that, and that's a continuative and iterative process where we're trying to get better every year. Um, and th those FOAs, uh, in turn, are used to generate grants, and, and that shapes what people who apply to us, um, how, how they design their projects. So we're certainly trying to influence it where we can. Well, I'll give one specific and uh, part of our funding opportunity announcement FOA that changed uh, in 2018. We used to ask tribes to identify or um, grant applicants to identify their problem statement. You know why why they should get the funding. Um, you know if if you have a certain language loss, you're applying for language funding. You know you give the number of speakers you have or something. So. Um, we have now changed that. So if you think of a problem, you're really like kind of wallowing in the deficits. You're looking at poverty rates. You're looking at suicide rates. So we've changed that to now be called a current community condition. So if you think of something as a problem, you know, you can wallow in that. But if it's a current community condition, that means it's just the condition at this point in time. And taking that asset braced hope for the future approach, you know, that thinking of something as the condition currently at the time allows you to think that it can change and be different. Um, so even, you know, even if you're going to work with a community in uh, co-authoring a grant, you know, even thinking of things that way, um, that, that there may be an issue in the community, but it might just be what's currently going on now. Um, and that there, there is definitely a hope for a more positive future. 
Thank you very much. Um, it was also noted that there are a couple of students who work with indigenous communities in Latin America and Africa, and they wanted to know if these items that you touched on in the presentation would be applicable to those communities. 100%. Um, Heather, do you, do you want to take first crack? I have a good specific example, but... Go first, Trav. I'll just jump in after you. Okay. I was, so my uh, faculty mentor at Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Emily Harose, worked on a study um, that really inspired a lot of the direction that, that I took with this presentation, where she looked for um, culturally specific um, mental disorders in northern Uganda, and so was able over a long period of time to identify these, these really unique symptoms that we don't see described really anywhere in the DSM, um, and see that and saw that they map together in really specific ways and was actually able to develop kind of a, a short list of mental health disorders that were really unique to that environment and that community and that culture. Um, so, you know, I think, and, and I'm gonna speak even broader, I don't think that this is just relevant to indigenous communities across Africa or Asia. I think this, this kind of approach is really important anytime you're doing an intervention, right? This community-based framework is, is important across the board because every community, whether you're talking about, you know, a, a suburban community in Atlanta or a, a group of Sami in Northern Sweden is, is unique and distinct and different. And, you know, an evidence-based intervention can only incorporate so much evidence. So whenever we go to deploy that in a specific setting, we really need to look at what's unique about that community and how can we improve the intervention from there. But it's particularly important in indigenous communities for all the reasons that Heather highlighted at the beginning and, and the harm that researchers have, have done in a really pronounced observable way. Thank you, Travis. I agree 100%. And like I was saying early in the earlier in the presentation that you might think of using this approach if you're working in any um, community period or an underrepresented community. Uh, you know, you can specifically see a, a deficit-based approach, how that affected um, the um, gay community in the U.S. that there was this huge stigma around um, men in, in the gay community in the U.S. when they first started to do research around HIV and AIDS. Um, the same thing, my husband is Kenyan, and the same thing happened in Africa. You know, they just start demonizing these populations, you know, like look at the rates of this and the rates of that, you know, instead of taking an asset-based approach and really considering that there's so many more factors than just this one statistic you're calling out and stigmatizing a whole community with. So I, I very much agree that the asset-based approach, the knowing the community history, participatory methods, I think that would really be appreciated in any community you work in. And even honestly, if you're studying up, Often we, often people do, um, don't study up, which is the perspective of, of studying people who are in power. Um, you know, we often, often we are looking at people who have had power taken away from them. And these are the people we work with in evaluation and in projects. But even if you are studying the people who are in power, there are specific cultures, there are specific mannerisms um, and things like that, that they are going to want you to, you know, accept and um, treat them how they're used to being treated. So there's, there's very much, you know, in building like an equitable, um, mutually beneficial relationship and research around any direction you're studying and any group you're working with. I just want to make a quick correction, by the way, the researcher on the study I was referencing was not uh, Dr. Harose. Um, I was thinking of Dr. Uh, Judith Bass, who's also at Johns Hopkins, uh, and I worked with uh, there. But I dropped the link to that study into the chat. Thank you very much. Um, our last question that I've seen in the chat is um, getting back to Travis's presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about culturally safe evaluation? Yeah, and I'd, I'd also, Heather, if you have anything to add, definitely, uh, definitely do so. But one, th one way that that deficit-based approach can be really harmful is, is if you're just going to a community, you're always talking about the problems and, and you're asking about these things in, in sort of a, a ham-fisted way, 
that can potentially be, you know, triggering when you're really diving into some really difficult topics like suicide or historical trauma, right? We're dealing with real people's lives. We're dealing with the struggles they face every day. And we're dealing with the struggles that their families have faced for generations and generations, right? So there can be a temptation to think of something like historical trauma as really abstract, um, but it's important to remember how immediate and present and personal these things are. So this is another part of the reason that we really want to involve the local community at every stage, right? Because they know what's going to be triggering. They know what's going to be potentially harmful in their community and they can help serve as guides to, to make sure that we're asking the right questions in the right ways. Um, there's been great work uh, done in New Zealand um, on this with Maori communities uh, that I'd recommend you look into, uh, particularly Margaret Cargo uh, is a good research to, researcher to take a look at. Um, but yeah, Heather, I don't, I don't know. Did you have anything you wanted to add on that? You're on mute there. There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Um, thinking of, you know, um, culture and things like that. So say, um, you know, you were interested in studying uh, boarding school trauma and how that has been um, in indigenous communities. So as a researcher, you would... Um, very likely be much younger than the population you would be working with um, as uh, the boarding school practices. Many of the people who went to the boarding schools are usually um, in their 80s or higher now. So uh, not only the delicacy around the fact um, that they went to boarding schools and the PTSD, you know, that you could trigger talking about their experiences, but there's also a relationship between you as a young person speaking to an elder. Even if it's not your culture, they're going to be expecting that relationship. So I'm gonna give you an example of a struggle I had in my master's research project. That is such, it's, it's such a great um, example of how something can just easily be um, misconstrued based on culture. So I was working, uh, the, the tr translator and research partner I, I did all the interviews with um, in Greenland was an older Inuit Greenlander man. He was in his late seventies. Um, and so for the most part, our relationship was great. You know, he translated, he back translated to me. Uh, we worked great together. And then one day, I'm not sure what happened, but he just started to be a lot more distant. And I was like, oh, you know, is something wrong? You know, and he's like, no, 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 you know. And so this kind of went on. We did a few interviews this way uh, and things were just getting like more and more awkward between us. And due to the fact that we are both Inuit, he is a man and I was about 50 years younger to him. He did not feel that I was someone he could um, confide into something that was bothering him. It wasn't culturally appropriate um, at all. So, um, you know, after it had been going on a few days, I actually, I asked him, you know, would you mind meeting with um, my supervisor that I'm traveling with? So the woman I was doing uh, research traveling with had known him for about seven years. Um, she was in her late fifties um, and she was also not an Inuit person. So, you know, um, oftentimes you'll find in some cultures that women talk to women and men talk to men, um, which is something very true in Greenland. In Greenland, I would not have focus groups mixed with men and women because that's not how the culture worked. Men talk to men and women talk to women. So, you know, we I brought in this outsider, non-Inuit person that he'd known for longer. And I asked him, is something wrong? He ignored me. My uh, supervisor repeated the exact same question, asked him if something was wrong. He turned to her and only responded to her talking about how um, there was a word that he didn't know how to translate between the languages. And he was just so embarrassed, you know, and uncomfortable. He could not uh, discuss that with me. So our conversation literally went with me us both directing our conversation through my supervisor so that we didn't talk to each other directly. Um, and so, I mean, that can be seen from the outside as maybe kind of strange or something like that. But, you know, honestly, like within um, our culture and making it uh, an appropriate way to work and respecting that culture can sometimes have things be a little different. So I just wanted to share that story. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question that just dropped into the chat, um, which is very topical for current events. 
Um, how can community consultation happen effectively during COVID-19 travel restrictions? Not being able to physically visit with the community? Can you talk about qualitative methods conducted remotely that can be culturally responsive? There it is. Okay, um, Travis, do you wanna take a crack or should I dive in? Do, do, you, do you have an answer in mind? Um, yeah, so, um, so actually, ANA, uh, we have, you know, we, we're just put out our funding opportunity announcements um, to grantees to be for them to apply to um, and conduct their own projects uh, starting in late 2021 or early 2022. And um, we definitely asked people to address this issue. I am also helping um, on some National Science Foundation um, panel reviews looking at how to address this with the restrictions. The, the examples that I can give thus far of what we've seen and um, in also uh, Travis and I, the our team under Amy, we also visit grantees as they're ending their projects. So we've talked to multiple grantees this year, not physical visits, we've been doing virtual visits about how they handled the last year of their grant as they were often in uh, COVID situations and in restriction. Um, and had to change their methodologies. So um, what we have found is, uh, you will, what you will often find is working in indigenous communities, they can often not have the type of uh, Wi-Fi or cable internet access, um, uh, cable or um, you know, the faster internet access that might be needed to be able to do a video chat. Um, we have found that uh, some communities have been able to send hotspots to um, use uh, funding from different grants to be able to buy hotspots to send people to put at their house. This has been one way specifically um, that enables people to then do the video chat communication. Uh, like I said, you know, that face-to-face -face communication is so important. So um, the, the hot spotting and using the video chat has been uh, one way this has been approached. Um, additionally, we have had grantees um, and in grants we've been reviewing, we've had people, you know, put a pause on activities and be planning to resume those more in the future. Um, we've also, I talked to one grantee that found that they were able to, uh, that the elders still felt it was more important to meet in person than um, through Zoom on the computer. So they um, set up chairs outside and um, he had a tape recorder and set it on a table between them, went, went and sat 10 feet away. And uh, they, they talked and talked into the uh, recorder because for the elder, the, the Zoom was just way too far out, outside of a cultural comfort. Um, I know my grandma who is uh, turning 90 this October, um, I have never pulled off video chatting with her yet. Um, I can, she still can't text me back yet. I'm not sure how, but so yeah, the technology things that have changed in the last few years are just amazing. So I would like uh, definitely talk about in that communication with communities, what works for them. Uh, and if you have people keep pushing back that no, we want it in person, you know, how can you do that in a safe way? Like the recorder on the table and then sitting across um, the, lawn, the lawn is one way to do that. Um, Travis, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think the two things that I've been thinking about here are not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and, and then just recognizing that that all of this is, is possible even in difficult circumstances. So, you know, in the first respect, I think we just need to acknowledge that the conversations we're talking about are difficult, um, that we're, when we talk about this adaptation process, it's it's often really involved, and it's and evaluating in a culturally safe way and, and a culturally appropriate way is takes a lot of relationship building, and that's harder to do virtually. But it's not impossible at the same time. So I think if we can recognize that you know doing this over Zoom is going to be suboptimal, um, but still better than not doing it, that's going to that's going to help shape our approach here. Um, and the other thing is, is just not, this goes along with that, but not using those kind of logistical 
difficulties as an excuse not to do it, right? Because there are all kinds of excuses not to do culturally appropriate evaluations. They're, they're inherently more difficult than just blazing ahead. Um, but as we talked about, of course, we're, we're doing these not just out of a sense of, of political correctness or what have you, but we're doing this because it genuinely is better for the community. It's genuinely better for the researcher. It's genuinely better for the, the literature. Um, there's real benefit in doing this despite the added difficulty. So I don't know, push ahead. And, and we've all learned a lot about interacting over Zoom and, and acknowledge that you know once we get back in person that it's gonna be easier and it's gonna be better. Um, that's, that's what I've thought of. Great, thank you both. Um, the, another question that just came in um, was, is the best resource on the step-by-step -step process oops, um, on getting free informed consent from Fitzpatrick at all? I think I read that question correctly. Um, is the best resource. Um, so the Fitzpatrick and all is actually not a specific to the free prior and informed consent as much as that one is really talking about the importance of community consent and individual consent when working with indigenous communities. Let me jump back to that slide. Um, so the free prior and informed consent, um, other places that you can start learning about it is definitely in actually the UN uh, Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, you can see uh, going there, you can see how it's incorporated into the different, um, the different um, types of respect, I would say, or the different rights and, and how they want it utilized. Um, so specifically, one example is free prior and informed consent uh, before taking indigenous land. So obviously that one happened, you know, a couple hundred years ago in the US. Um, however, you know, in, in new ways now that it's in, you know, UNDRIP and different communities that are agreeing to it, they're supposed to be um, looking, seeking that free prior of an informed consent before doing something like um, mowing down a, a, a forest and putting up a mall or something. Or in the U.S., you know, we saw some issues with the border wall building um, across the Tohono O'odham Reservation, a traditional land which actually is in the US and in Mexico. So there was a lot of issues around, um, you know, uh, building a wall that actually separated the families between the two countries and also um, disturbed burial grounds for those communities. So there are examples still of free prior and informed consent not being taken into account. Uh, one of the biggest issues you'll hear with UNDRIP is that yes, it has a lot of great things. We wish that was the way it was, but even countries who have said, you know, they support UNDRIP or um, that you know they'll learn from UNDRIP, they still haven't changed um, their, uh, you have to change um, federal law, you have to change case law um, because precedent has been set in past cases. So the amount of change that would have to happen um, in the United States to actually utilize UNDRIP in the way that it's written would be unbelievably massive, the amount of law and things it would have to undo. Um, but so yeah, I would, for UNDRIP, I would jump first, I mean, for free prior and informed consent, I would jump first to UNDRIP to kind of get the grounding of where that's coming from. Yeah. I dropped a link into the chat as well from the United Nations. It's a manual on, on free prior and informed consent that has uh, sort of a six step breakdown. Um, like Heather said, the, the United Nations has a ton, a ton of resources on, on free prior and informed consent. And if you, if you just Google that term in UN, you're gonna come up with pages of all kinds of different UN agencies that have worked on it. I also think about, I think there's probably, and this could be personal bias, but I think there's been more work done on this in Canada than in the States. Um, so I would also look at Canadian resources as well. Um, I know the group Cultural Survival, um, which is a nonprofit, um, has additional resources on FPIC. So look at all those places. And by the way, I did, Canada is not, you know, 
uh, I think we're a little bit ahead of, of the states, but not perfect, not flawless at all. A long, long history of, of terrible things to indigenous people and, and uh, only recently taking some steps to remediate it. Yeah, Travis, remind me again, um, I was just writing about the other day, that big, um, like that process they went through recognizing all the things they did, it came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've actually done a, a lot of work with the recommendations that were developed out of that. My my aunt is a human rights lawyer um, in Canada and a human rights consultant, so I've I've helped uh, with some of her projects. And uh, yeah, the TRC comes up all the time. It's it's a great resource to look at to see a model of how Indigenous people and the government have, and and other institutions like churches um, have come together to look at some of the historical wrongs and, and tried to figure out what redress could look like. Great, thank you both. Um, I believe that those are all the questions. Um, Michael did drop in um, a link to Cultural Survival, um, which is a, a organization that a and has actually funded. Oh, awesome. But, um, but um, Beverly, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Thank you very much Heather and Travis for leading us today, Amy for helping us with our questions and to our alums and students for joining us. We really appreciate the time that you spent with us today and for helping us all better understand how we can engage with indigenous tribes and communities in evaluation research. Thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be back at AU. Wonderful. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you so much. And feel free, our, our emails are in the chat to reach out with anything else. Thank you. Thank you.